thank you, um, Matt, and thanks to the Parks Community Centre invi um, for inviting me here today to this forum to speak to you. It's just beautiful to be down here and talk to some of the guys when Glenn did that exercise this morning from different countries. It's wonderful. Yes, it's such a joy to be back here. It's a beautiful part of our world to live in. I just wanted to pay my respects and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to them and their culture and to elders both past and present. Matthew's given me a bit of an introduction. I do work from Newcastle around Australia and overseas as a men's health consultant. I am currently the vice president of AMHF, which is the national peak body for improving men's health. And there's a state peak body for New South Wales that I'm the president of. And I'm on the board of a number of different groups around the place. Before I move on to that, I just wanted to acknowledge the fact that we're here for Men's Health Week, um, which I don't know if you know the origins of, started with a meeting in Vienna in Austria, of all places, in 2002. And it started with, as far as we can see, six players, Australia, Men's Health Forum of the United Kingdom, Canada, Holland, and the Men's Health Network of the USA, and possibly one other. Um, but we did make some early attempts to do something in Men's Health Week in 2002, and then it took off after that. So technically, this is 15 years of running Men's Health Week in Australia. In the United States, they have a Men's Health Month. They take the whole month. Um, and at the moment, it's 26 countries and growing around the world. And probably during this week, there's something like 300 to, uh, three to 400 men's health events in the week happening across Australia. So in a way, it's been a huge success. And if I can just go back to my first slide here, what I wanted to talk to you today about was, I think we're actually moving in the right direction with men's health in this country. And I wanted to talk about a few things, and I'm gonna range over a few things, I think. But basically, overall, we are doing very well, I think, a generational change in this country and all the work that we've put in over the last 10 to 20 years um, to improve men's health in this country. Now, I'm also saying we shouldn't sit back on our laurels and say everything's fine. Everything isn't fine. It's not fine at all. But we're making steps in the right direction. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, when I talk about health, and this you may know this or maybe not, um, it's not just about physical or biological health. Biological being is the way you were born. Your genetic makeup is you, right? And if we introduce some new disease into this room, half of you would get sick and half of you wouldn't, depending on your genetic makeup. Why is that important? Because some things are hereditary, some things are genetic. Depression, for example, is hereditary. Most people know about the physical stuff, heart disease, diabetes, gout, all of that. Social stuff, how much money you've got, where you, you know, who loves you, who do you love, where do you live. Money is a big source of, um, when, when Glenn did that exercise before asking us why do men suicide, the people I was talking to all talked a lot about money or lack of money, so that's important. Um, cultural, we're a multicultural country and, and Sydney's a very multicultural place, so taking into consideration those things. And also that we share this country with our indigenous brothers and sisters. Psychological stuff, we can't tell if a guy looks, is, is okay or healthy by looking at him. Often someone will look quite healthy to us, but if he's a guy who wakes up in the morning, looks in the mirror and hates himself, then he's probably not going to be around for too much longer and we can't pick that up by just seeing. So what's going on up here and inside a person, we need to know about that. And that leads me on to the spiritual stuff about meaning and purpose in life, which is really important, I think, for all men, but it sort of kicks in in my mind uh, for men in their late 50s as we get older. I run a program for men called Meaning for Men that looks at like purpose in life, which as we go through life, we can lose our purpose in life or it can change. And sometimes we have to get back on focus with that stuff. Why are we concerned with men's health at all? 
Well, I think um, Matthew did a great job at the beginning of going through the statistics about men's health in Australia. That's just another set of basically the things that he was saying. So I won't linger too much on that. The life expectancy is five years lower than women. Men are, you know, as Glenn said, more likely to, co to commit suicide. Men get involved in more risk-taking experiences. Men experience stress but don't seek out support in the same way that women do. I think we do seek out support, but it's different. It's different, and often, by being different, it can be missed as well. Oh, and I wanted to mention gender medicine, um, which, um, again, Matthew alluded to this morning. Um, Gender medicine is very big in the United States and it, there's do doctors in Australia have an understanding of it, but in the United States it's become the hot new thing in medicine. What it basically means is that men and women's bodies are different and sorry guys, here's the bad news, women's bodies are built stronger than ours. They were designed that way. Whoever designed them designed women's bodies to be stronger because they have children. So their immune systems, all of their systems are stronger than, than the male of the species, right? This is the bad news, I'll get it <laughs> um, And they were designed that way and doctors have known this for years in Australia. When, when doctors treat people for the same illness, say some cancers or even HIV, they give more drugs to men than they give to women because they, men need those drugs more because they, chemotherapy, for example, they'll give more to a male. This is not new news to doctors in Australia. They do it every day. They just don't sort of talk about it, but we do it every day. Which leads me on to the point that when women get the flu, they're normally over it in about four or five days. But for us, we suffer and suffer for about eight or nine days and 10 days. And what happens? They come up with man flu and they say, oh, look at this money, you know. Men over there with the flu, they should be up now. Man flu, right? Is, there's no such thing as man flu. I'm here to tell you that men take longer to get over a cold or influenza. We can all feel better now. I hope, feel a little bit better. It's not our fault, again. Sometimes these things always get labelled as being our fault because we're male. But our bodies are weaker and the flu is a good example of it. We actually take longer to get, get well again. I want to debunk a couple of myths with you. First up, why don't men use services? <clears throat> There's a reason out there that men aren't in touch with their needs, and I don't believe that. Um, I believe that we don't deliver messages to men that their health and well-being is important, and services aren't geared to meet men's needs. There's this thing of like one of the one of the techniques or things we can do is say to a guy you need to go to the doctor. When he arrives there, he arrives at a, a general practice surgery full of pap smear posters, breast cancer posters, baby posters, and if he's really lucky, he gets to read one of those year old women's weeklies while he's waiting to see the doctor, right? Isn't that what most GP um, waiting rooms look like in this country? Not very men friendly. I sometimes wonder why we, we waste our time directing men to non-men friendly places like GP surgeries. So we work a lot with doctors across the country to, to get them to be more male friendly, to put some magazines into the um, waiting room that men would read, to put in their posters and brochures, it can be done. And doctors are slowly changing that across Australia. So it's a bit like, if you had a party and people didn't come to your party, Shouldn't you be asking what was wrong with the party, not what's wrong with the people who didn't come? The party could have been on the wrong day, maybe it rained on that day, maybe there was a Western Bulldogs game on that day. There could be a thousand reasons why people didn't turn up to your party. But, you know, you'd think of it that way, it must have been something I did rather than the people who didn't turn up. But I can tell you back in the 60s and 70s, that's exactly how we treated men in the health system, health and welfare systems in this country, it was always men's fault that their health was bad. We used to call it the men behaving badly model. You know, you smoke too much, you drink too much, you're too fat, you're bad to your wife. We gave them messages like that and guess what, they never came back. 
So we've stopped doing that. We've grown up. We've realised that we don't give negative messages to people about, about their gender. If we were to do any of that stuff to women, they, they shouldn't come back either if they got that treatment off any healthcare worker, you know, it's not the way to go. And the uh, male, National Male Health um, Plan spells that out, that all of our services need to be more men friendly, which I'll talk about in a minute. Men aren't interested in their health and well-being. This is uh, a survey that was done by Foundation 49, a men's health organisation in Victoria. Large number of men, 2046 survey, 55% had a health check in the last 12 months, 74% rated that as good, 73% talked about their health with their family, friends at social gatherings, functions and work. 82.3% of men who were likely to participate in a health check in the workplace if one's offered. It doesn't look, those fig, if you look at those figures, does that tell you a story about men who don't care about their health? It, it doesn't say that to me, right? And this has been around for a long time. And we get, we're doing more and more research that tells us the same thing. Men are interested in their health if we do it in the right way. And there's a lot in this slide you could pick out. At work, men's health in the workplace programs really work. They're really effective. I'm off tomorrow to, for a breakfast meeting with 200 Optus employees for Men's Health Week with, with a panel discussion out at um, Macquarie Fields. Works really well. We've been doing men's health talks in the workplace, in men's health and workplace programs, sorry, for a number of years now and they work really well. Uh, with family and friends in mosques, in churches, at sporting games, at anywhere that guys hang out, if you go there and give them information, then they receive that information. So that's the way we should be going. Now, gender is one of the most consistent um, predictors of health and longevity. Unfortunately, it's, it's not good news uh, for men. The World Health Organization states that health outcomes for men and boys continue to be worse than girls and women. Yet, there seems to be, yet this kind of gender-based inequality in health receives little national, regional, or global acknowledgement, but and there's a bit of a but to this, it is slowly changing. People are becoming more and more aware of it. And this statement by the World Health Organization three years ago now has started that change globally. So we are starting to do some things about it. And I just wanted to talk briefly about equality for men. This is Glenn Poole's excellent book, which is on sale here. Uh, I couldn't understand the whole equality, inequality thing until I read his book. I mean, I used to grapple with it. I used to have a bit of a knowledge, but the book's fantastic because it's so simple. It just makes this stuff really simple. Most times when we have conversations about equality, they tend to focus on everyone but men and boys. There's areas where men on average aren't doing as well. We know that. Um, supporting equality for men doesn't mean opposing equality for women. Both men and women experience inequality in different parts of their lives. So, you know, when we say men aren't equal, we're not saying anything about women. We're making a statement about men, as we can make a statement about women. It's very, it's very equal. Why is it important? The countries, the world's most equal countries are happier, healthier, safer places for people to live in. Why focus on men and boys? Because most of the time, and I've seen this again and again, we focus on groups like women, um, LGBTI people, people who aren't heterosexual, if you don't like that alphabet of words. Um, black people, disabled people, unemployed people, unpaid people, unhealthy people. All of those groups, and the group that's missing is men. We don't actually focus on men. We haven't yet. So we need to, we need to have a cultural shift. We need to change our thinking to focus on men, which is what Matthew said earlier this morning in a different way, in a very good way, and I think all of us are on that same page. Matthew does great work in this area. <clears throat> and a spectacular gender gap, gap has resulted in men's health problems being allocated a quarter of the funding of women's health. And again, Matthew's covered that some, what, this morning, men are 60% more likely to die from cancer, for example, um, but he, as he said this morning, more money goes to breast cancer than, than um, prostate cancer. 
And I think he also mentioned this fact, and we could be covering ground going over this again. Uh, men's Health ranked 36 for the federal government funding in 2012 behind sexually transmitted diseases and just in front of parasitic infections. So on a scale, that's sort of, you know, we're, we're, we're not, we're pretty down there. Uh, cancer's interesting. The fact is that two Australian men will be diagnosed with cancer by the age of 85. One in two Australian men will have some cancer experience in their lifetime right now. There's a lot of cancer around. It's one in three for women. Give it four more years, it'll be one in two for both. Cancer isn't an equal opportunity disease. It doesn't work that way. Cancer will affect men and women equally in a few more years. But at the moment, that experience is one in two for men and one in three for women. But the good news, if you're sitting there going, oh, I'm really worried about what he just said, um, the good news is that people are living longer. We've got better treatments for cancer right across the board in every cancer. If it's, if it's, er if it's detected early, more people survive. So our messages are about early detection of cancer, all right? And we've got better drugs and most people are surviving. So. It's not a good experience having cancer, I'm not saying that for one minute as, a, as someone who knows that, but, um, but you know, survival rates are much better. Why help men? I don't know if anyone's ever wondered about that, but um, Glenn, Glenn and I have wondered about that from time to time. Because we want a world that works for everyone, where every person of every gender can flourish and receive and reach their individual potential in ways that can help us collectively create a world that works for everyone. That seems pretty logical that we would want that. How can we help men? By identifying, developing and supporting pathways to potential for men and boys. By helping those who help men. By inspiring others to help men. By being here today. You're all doing this because you've given of your time today to be here. So you're helping people who help men and you're helping men by being here. So thank you for being here today. You're doing that right now. I wanted to talk about one group though that I think is a priority group that gets missed and that's single men. At any given point in time in Australia, 40% of the male population are single from 18 over. The stats haven't changed much over the years. We've seen a little bit of generational change in the last few years with generation X, Y, Z, and I'm not sure where we're up to, but those younger people, men and women, are choosing to stay single longer and not get married in their early 20s. They're waiting, they're travelling, they're getting their career together, they're, they're marrying longer. So that's had a little bit of an effect in these figures. So we've got people who are single by choice and happy that way. There's nothing wrong with being single. But, it, but why I'm bringing this up is that's 40% of the population. So when we think and talk about health promotion with men. And if we're using words like wife, partner and family, you're talking to 60% of the population. You're not talking to the other 40%. It's, just, just, it's a reminder. And there's a group in here, in that bracket, called Single Limited Income Males, or SLIMs, were identified by the Brotherhood of St Lawrence in Melbourne many years ago. And I'll, paint, I'll give you a picture of SLIMs that we worry about, single limited income males. They may not have finished school, they went into trades, blue collar trades that don't, don't exist anymore. Um, so they're largely unemployed, they largely stay at home. They go out to the pub, that's about it. They normally don't have custody of children and they're not great relationship fodder for women who want a male that doesn't look like that. So that's, I'm defining them. They're 66% of all welfare recipients in Australia. So I'm painting that picture and I'm saying, that's what we need to worry about, how we access those men, how can we actually deliver health promotion messages and make changes in their life. We can do it, but they're a difficult group and they don't stay like that forever. That's the good news. Also, this is the highest suicide rate group, by the way, as well. well you know, if they're distressed in that place, that could be a factor. All of those factors that I've talked about could be a factor in, in uh, increased rate of suicide. 
But they don't always stay like that. They meet people, they do have relationships, they can go back and get retrained, they go and do a course, they get out of that, their life changes and they move on. But we've had this group consistently now for nearly 30 or 40 years in Australia and I think we don't target them very well. We need to do more. And another change in the structure of Australian families is that mum, dad and two kids is now the min minority family in Australia. It's about 49% and dropping. I think it's dropped actually to 48, it's 46, it's 46%. 51% um, of all other families are different. They don't look like mum, dad and kids. Uh, they're single parent families, the majority are women, or they're same sex couples with children, or they're couples without children. So we've had a bit of a change in our family dynamics in the country. And which leads me on to talking about social connectedness, which I'm really interested in at the moment. This report from Beyond Blue came out a couple of years ago and it was a really good report and what it shows is that for some <coughs> men, uh, and they re um, some men of middle age, nearly a quarter of men, 23%, approximately 1.1 million, in their middle years score low on, on that scale of social uh, connectedness and could be at risk of isolation. One quarter of those men had no one outside their immediate family they could rely on. And this was a large cohort, I didn't put the figures up, but it was from memory about two and a half thousand men I think they interviewed. Men experiencing a lack of social connectedness would rarely feel able to bring their neediness up in conversations and it's rarely if ever a topic of public discourse. In other words, we don't talk about it. We're not talking about it. You're not raping up the paper every day and seeing stories about how this group of men don't have anyone that they can talk to or anyone that they can rely on. These men often lack the skills, pathways and frequently the drive to remedy their lack of social connectionness, connectedness and instead tend to bear the misery and shame of their situation with that good old Australian stoic masculinity that we can do sometimes like we've talked about already. Like, you know, everything will be all right. So, oh, and uh, uh, yes, and a fast fact on that, 50%, 56% of lifeline calls are from those living alone. So I guess I'm heralding this a little bit as a current but future problem that we need to do something about and work on straight away. And we have started to do that a bit. Um, that's more stats from the same report saying that 61% had lost contact with more friends than they would like in the past few years during, owing to all these things that are fairly normal, changes in family circumstances, illness, mental health, finances, change in work, all of those things that happen to people. But what's happened to this group of men is they've lost their connections with other people. And practical barriers, financial and health things all contribute. That makes a lot of sense to me. Illness and disability could trigger off all of those things. And one, one of the most successful um, strategies, if you like, that we have are men's sheds, obviously. But um, not all men want to go to a men's shed. And if we looked at it, men's sheds are a great idea and I'm hugely supportive of men's sheds. But we know if we looked at the figures that, you know, that's not the total answer. It's a damn good answer and it's a good start. So we're, we're doing well in that area, but we need to do some other things. And there's a bit of a gender difference too with this social connectedness of men. And I think it starts in childhood. There's a difference between boys and girls. Boys strive for independence. They define their identity by separating from their parents and usually their mother as quick as they can. Most boys think that's a good thing to do, whereas girls welcome interdependence. They define their identities through social connections. And, and I don't know if you've seen young people when they go out at night, um, both, young, both young girls and boys, I think, tend to go out in packs, <laughs> like all girls together, all boys together. But often the, the interesting behaviour in Newcastle, they did some research because they were worried about the safety of young girls and boys around 17 to 18 to 19 going out at nightclubs late at night in Newcastle. And what they discovered was amazing really, that even though girls might have gone out in packs, they separated. By the end of the night they separated and they were found on their own with a bit too much to drink, in dark places, in danger, 
Whereas the boys went home together. The boys actually had this protective kind of behaviour that they stayed together, therefore they didn't put themselves in danger, which is you know, what, not what the research was expecting. So, yeah, it's just letting you know that I think girls and boys um, operate in different ways. And as we get older, remember we've got a, a bigger ageing population of women because women live longer, right? And if, they are, if they're a gender that likes to socialise and stay together and stay connected, which they are, then they're okay. As opposed to men who may have lost those connections with friends and mates over time and end up not, you know, for a thousand different reasons that we've talked about on their own. <coughs> what can we do about this problem of social connectedness? We can help men to build resilience by our programs that connect them up and reduce their distress. We can help them initiate new relationships and that can be difficult, but we actually have to train them, or well, not train, but get them to learn that they can develop new relationships as they get older with like-minded people. We're already doing this. We're starting men's sheds in nursing homes. I don't know if you know that. And they're great, great idea. Nursing homes have come up with something. What was something we can do for the men? They could see that the men in the nursing homes were being isolated in, inside a nursing home. So they've actually started men's sheds in nursing homes or they've started that concept that takes them out to social activities out of the nursing home. So there's some really good work being done on it, some creative ideas. Reminding men and partners that men need social connectedness and a public acknowledgement of this, all of that stuff. So some of the key approaches, just summing up, what I've been talking about so far. Um, to men's health, we need to focus on that philosophy of healthcare that promotes wellness and a positive image of men and boys. We need to develop, obviously, men health friendly, sorry, men friendly health and wellbeing strategies. We need to build on and increase opportunities for partnership work, which you are so good at, can I just say. I think the Parks Community Centre is an excellent example of doing partnership work with an NGO, with other people in the community, with sports clubs. That's what I'm talking about. You're a model of successful um, partnership work. And that's in the men's health field. We don't have a lot of money yet. Um, so anything that works between government, non-government and the private sector, that's how we work really well. Or today wouldn't be happening. You're very good at, good at doing that. Talk with men and boys rather than at them. Go to males in their own environment. Show them the way to better health. Don't tell them what to do. And establish the need for improvement in male health, which again, forums like this are doing. And having a passion for the needs of male health in your community. Both Matthew, who's here somewhere, and um, our other speakers today, Glenn and uh, Stewie, are all examples of people who not only do good work, but are passionate about the work that they do. And I think it shows. Global Action on Men's Health, just giving you a bigger picture now. There is a bigger picture outside Australia. There is an organisation that's working to change things around the world. They're the people who belong to it, including Australia. At the moment, the chairperson of this committee is Australian from the Men's Health Information Resource Centre here in Western Sydney. Um, the bigger picture on this is that's what they want to do. They want to work with the World Health Organisation to, to organise seminars and report, which is happening at the moment, or the, the first steps towards that report's happening. And they want it to include both men and women in efforts to reduce gender inequalities of health. So there is a bigger world out there. Only three countries in the world have a national male health policy. Australia was the second one, Ireland beat us by 18 months, right at the middle of the economic recession. So Ireland came up with the, the world's first national male health, um, health policy and not a cent of money to go along with it. 18 months later, we, uh, under the Rudd government, released the national male health policy there with some Money went to men's sheds and some money went to a few other things, but again, not a lot of money behind it. Um, and the third country in the world is Brazil, who has a national male health policy. 
And I'll go on to talk about this. The policy's great. We just need some things to follow on after that, like an action plan and some money. The European Commission has also looked at the, at the health of men in Europe, which is a great document, this one. Anyone guess what country in Europe or what country in the world has the worst health for men? Guess, go on. I don't have a prize, but you can, yeah. India, no, India's pretty good. It's Scotland. Scotland's got the lowest life expectancy for men in the world. It's the, no, it's the kills, maybe it's the kills, maybe it's the, is that a connection to man flu in the kills? No, no, I'm okay. Um, what are the uh, deep fried things they have in Scotland? Deep fried Mars bars. If you've ever had a deep fried Mars bar, you might be on the path to see why Scottish men's health isn't so good. And it's to do with a whole lot of social factors. High unemployment, they don't have jobs, they do drink a bit, and they have a pretty bad diet. Second worst after them is Russia, for similar reasons, for very similar reasons to Scotland. So the summer, uh, life expectancy in Scotland is about 65 years compared to Australia that's 77 or heading towards 78 years. So I'm just saying that to give you a bigger picture thing that you know there are countries around the world where men's health is worse and, and they're not doing anything about it. Russia's got no infrastructure for doing the things we have to improve men's health at all. So travelling on from that, <clears throat> this report on the 31 countries in the world that do do some men's health listed Australia as being ahead of most countries in the world, and it's true. This was um, a statement made by the Professor of Men's Health in the UK. So what that says to me is a couple of things. One, it's, you might be surprised that Australia is leading the world in, in men's health innovation. But if we stop for a minute and thought about that, Men Sheds Movember, which is the biggest non-government men's health organisation in the world, in the world, with the biggest budget that turns over billions of dollars every year globally now. Um, men's health nights rub, running pubs or clubs across Australia, we've been doing that for ages. Um, just all of the amount of work we've been doing a long time. That doesn't happen much in Europe. It happens a bit in England and Scotland, uh, sorry, England and Ireland. Um, doesn't happen much in the United States, I can tell you. The United States has been trying to change things at, at a high level, but it hasn't actually worked yet. So why I'm showing you this is not to say, oh, geez, that's beaut, we should just all go home now. We've still got a lot to do in Australia. We've got a lot of work to do. But in some ways, there's a couple of things. It makes me feel good that we've been on the ball here. We've got a national male health policy. We've got amazing men's health workers around this country. But why are we, what, what do you reckon is this reason why we might be better at this or where we're kicking more goals maybe than other countries? And I, we don't know the answer. I'm not going to ask you that as a question. We don't know the answer. But we have done a little bit of research into it over the years. A guy in Victoria looked at it. And his theory is, takes us back to the war and to the Japanese, uh, the Australians that were interned in the Japanese camps during the war, who looked after each other. Um, and looked after each other through sickness, through death. And Bill, in his theory is, built the tradition of mateship in this country. So his theory is that if you looked at the Australian culture, uh, and that strong um, part of the Australian culture around mateship, at the end of the day, we actually do care, and we do care about other men, and we do care about men's health. And I think he's probably on the right track. We haven't got a, we haven't got a better idea than that, but I think we're probably on that track. I won't say too much about that, <coughs> except we have, this is a slide about how we have developed from the 1970s to now, where we started with small groups, no money. Um, 
Tailing on the end of feminism, the first men, uh, men's groups in Australia were what we call pro-feminists. There were men who believed in feminism, probably started the first groups. They were unpaid, or they were around issues to do with kids and family law, maybe. And we've moved through to where we are now, where it's academic professionals, men's health workers and consultants like myself and Glenn. We've got a national male health plan, and we've been running conferences, national conferences, since 2005. The Australian Men's Health Forum is the peak body. That's just a statement of what we do. We, we are a group of men and women who are interested in improving men's health. Our vision is for all males, men and boys in Australia to have optimal quality of life. Pretty simple mission statement, really. And we run the National Male, male Health Conferences alongside the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Conferences. We run them together. We have prepared a Male Health in Australia call for action last year, which, if you're interested, is on the AMHF website or I can send it to you. Um, there is a National Men's Health Plan. Now, the National Men's Health Plan that, um, is still in place. It's a good plan. It needs an action plan. And what we know currently at the moment is that both sides of government are interested in men's health. The current Turnbull government keeps saying it's interested in men's health and to that degree has just funded AMHF for the first time for a quarter of a million dollars. We've been a voluntary organisation with no monies for a long time. So we, I'm telling you because there hasn't been a public announcement we have been funded and that'll allow us to employ someone full time and maybe a few other workers as well. That interview process is up and running now, so we're in the middle of that process to employ someone for the first time. So that money's come through and that's a bit of a first for us. And also I was asked in March the 10th by the ALP to do a forum in Canberra with their shadow minister of health and about 30 people, I facilitated that, about 30 people from around Australia, like prominent people in the men's health area, came together in Canberra to give a blueprint to the Labor government about what they should be doing, or Labor opposition, I mean, if they get into government, should be doing about men's health. And a lot of it was about saying, this is good, it needs to be reviewed, it needs an action plan, and it needs some funding. So we can move it. There's nothing basically wrong with the plan, it's pretty damn good. It just needs some dollars put behind it. So they've got that clear message too. So I'm just letting you know both sides of um, major parties in the, at a federal level are, are well aware of man's health and we hopefully will get some more funding. From our document that we produced, these are just some stats out of there and we've talked about suicide today a fair amount. Um, males account for 93% of all work related for, for of fatalities, of fatal accidents, I mean. Uh, males experience 70% of work-related injuries, 75% of suicides we've talked about that. Glenn's covered that. Can I just mention, though, that, you know, Glenn's started the Stop Male Suicide Project um, about a year and a half ago, um, and it's, it's fantastic. Um, on several levels, we've never had anything like that before. We've never had a program that actually looks at male suicide, yet high, males have been the highest um, gender affected by suicide in this country. All our stuff's been general and too general, and as Glenn's pointed out, and I won't go over it, probably not aimed at men at all. It doesn't work very well for men, it works really well for women, and I think he's explained that really well. So it's great we've got this stuff, male suicide, and the first, uh, not the first conference, but um, the first Stop Male Suicide Prevention Conference will be happening in November at Parramatta. And all the details are on his website or my website. <laughs> We're working on that together. Um, for adult males, the leading cause of years lost to disability are those things. Anxiety, depression, diabetes type 2, hearing loss, asthma and dementia. Mental illness affects just over half of the Australian male population, approximately one in six males report experiencing mental illness in the past 12 months. You can do this, I invite you to do this, I found out this way, do a quick Google search for women's health and you'll get 152 million results. 
Do the same for men's health and you get 22.3 .3 million results. Qu quite a difference, which is one of the reasons why men's health isn't very good in Australia because it, we don't get the health information that we need. If I was to go into a local news agent here, I, pre I bet I could find 10 to 12 magazines, women's magazines that had health information in them. For men, it's probably one called Men's Health Magazine, which is an American conglomerate available in many countries around the world, and maybe one for guys who like to go to the gym. That's it. There's very little men's health information on TV, in social media, Anywhere you go, there's very little information around. So I, my theory is that women grow up getting a lot of health information and knowing stuff that we don't and we learn it later in life or we have to have better access to it. And the, and the Google um, search just points that out, basically. So that, that's about having, you know, not enough information for men about their health. Government. Um, Research funding for male health is about one quarter of that that's been allocated to women. We've talked about that. So that plan, I, that, the um, plan that we put out called on all political parties to do all these things, like to support the policy, to basically make a whole lot of changes that are up there. I won't go through them. That's, the that's been sent to all political parties in Australia, all of them. I've, I've received the call to action. Some have responded. The major ones I might add have responded. As you go down the list of minor parties, you've got no hope of response because I don't think it, they understand the, the notion of male health. <clears throat> and I want to spend a little bit of time now moving on to defining the new macho. And I found, I've, I've wanted, I found this ad. This is a campaign <laughs> that ran in New South Wales about uh, 12 years ago. Are you man enough to be a nurse? It's the first time nursing took on uh, wanting to enrol more men as nurses. And you'll see all these little um, action figures at the top here. This is a very male friendly male recruitment poster and it worked. Recruitment of male nurses in, in New South Wales went up by about 18% owing to this campaign. Why I'm showing you this is because one of the problems, I think, is we don't have a lot of men in what we call the caring professions, not only nursing, teaching, social work, counselling, all of those things, we don't have a lot of men there. So our boys are growing up sometimes in single parent families with no male role models around, going to school where there's less male teachers, less male youth workers, so anything we can do to get men back into caring, you know, looking at the caring professions as a place to work will help. And this is a good example of how we do it. There's three reasons my men aren't in that. Can anyone say what those reasons might be? Money. money. Bang on the money. Second one? It's something women do. It's a social um, assumption, which is wrong that women do the caring stuff and men don't. What's the third one? Yep. That's how much? Child sex or abuse. Yeah. Yep. That's the third one. It's the child sexual abuse stuff we've gone so far in one direction, I'd put to you, that it's a real worry for men to now take on jobs where there's going to be young children around. And, and this is even, we've got hardly any male primary school teachers, let alone in every other area. So we need to fix that rebalance and we need to stop demonising men around kids because men are lovely around kids, there's good fathers in the world, men are to be trusted around children all the time, you know, and the research and figures show us all that stuff, but it's just been a, a bad perception by the public. What I wanted to talk about was defining a new macho, and this is some thinking that's coming out of the United States, so I'll be clear about where it's coming from. But bringing back the word macho for most people was a word we hated, um, being proud to be a man. And it's 
it's about being proud to be a man and it's going against the thing we're hearing a lot of these days called toxic masculinity, which I really can't stand hearing that. Next to man up, it's the other two words I hate most in life. Toxic masculinity. Imagine if we said, oh, you know, what about that toxic femininity? Wouldn't women be outraged? I'm sure you'd be outraged. Yet, yeah, toxic masculinity has come into the vogue. And it's a thing now in the last couple, a couple of years. And so this is moving against that to say that the new match means about loving yourself as a man, taking pride in whatever incarnation of manhood and masculine energy you are. And you can express that and you should be accepted and admired for being a man. In our popular culture, men are often portrayed as incompetent fathers and husbands or bumbling and clueless with women, at best devious, dangerous and violent at worst. So self-compassion is one of the first foundations of the new macho guy. And I would also say self-compassion should be the first starting point for us all, men and women. Um, redefining that role in our culture, we have a tradition of telling men that expressing themselves emotionally isn't okay, but it is okay and needed for men to feel okay about expressing their emotions. We need to stop manning up. We need to man down. Okay, I'll give you a new phrase to take home today. There's a bit of take home. Man down, not up. When we man up, I've got this vision of man up in my mind is like putting the barrier up. That's what's going up. This barrier against us so the world won't get in there, so we won't have to say anything. Man up's one of the most unhelpful terms that you read about. Every time someone says to another guy, man up, he's saying to them, there's something you're doing that's not right by somebody's standards, I don't know whose, but you're not doing it properly. So I'd suggest we stop manning up and I suggest we man down, we drop the barriers, we listen, we think about how we're hearing things from other people, we talk about ourselves and as Glenn was saying, we deal with things that are happening around us and we can do that. There's no need to put up barriers. Healthy expression of male emotions is often portrayed as pathetic. Um, the new macho sees that beauty in men and offers men um, success about their manhood and it's about pride in manhood and masculinity. And that we're doing a great job at it and we really should be really proud of ourselves. New macho involves clearing out the toxic definitions of man, manhood and masculinity that have hurt a lot of people. The strongest, most health, healthy masculine men aren't the outwardly tough ones or the hateful ones, or the dangerous ones. They're the tender ones, the gentle ones, the confident, the playful, and at times the goofy ones. That's the ones we like. We actually think they're really cool, the goofy ones. Nerds have got a great place in our society at the moment, or tech heads, or whatever you want to call them. But they're an example of what I'm talking about as well. New macho pride can be based on self-compassion and compassion for others. <clears throat> this is a quote from Adam, who's the CEO of Movember. The world has changed in so much of our definition of what it is to be a man. The issue of masculinity is not a gender specific issue. It's one that is a huge implication for both men and women. We're, both, we're in this together. It's an issue that in order to address in a meaningful way, it needs everyone to play a role. It's not a problem for men. This is a problem for us all and as such needs to be addressed at the individual and society level. We can be trained in compassion, but we easily lose sight of it. We need to practice compassion and wish for us and others to have happiness and contentment. Compassion is the yearning that we, end, uh, that we and others are free from suffering. Empathy is the seed of compassion, but it's a little bit more than empathy. Compassion is empathy plus reason. Empathy is what is, which is feeling for others and reason which is wise and practical reason. And we're all in the business of ending suffering for people, be it ourselves or someone else. And the work that you do, the work that Nat does and the work that a lot of you do, work that you do in Men's Sheds is actually 
most of the time about ending suffering for someone else. So all I'm saying is start with compassion to yourself, appreciate yourself, appreciate the skills you've got, appreciate yourself in whichever way you want to and look after yourself because the better shape you're in, the better you can look after other people and you can show compassion to other people. It's very easy for us to show compassion to animals, I think. If you have a pet, you're showing compassion to that pet. You're loving it unconditionally, you're feeding it, looking after it. Easy to do it with pets. Sometimes we lose sight of doing it with people. So it's just bringing back, you know, the way we should act towards people. And when we encounter human suffering, this is a quote from the Dalai Lama, it's important to respond with compassion rather than question the politics of those we help. Or, dare I say, the gender of the people that we help or the politics that's connected with that. So, the Ottawa Charter for Blokes. If we get this all right, this is what the world would look like. We know that we've achieved everything to improve men's health when smoking, head injury, drowning, violence, suicide and child abuse are considered to be male health issues. We're well on the way to doing that. When the Skills Olympics includes playing with toddlers and conflict resolution as main events. When empathy does not translate as women's disadvantage and gender does not mean men are born oppressors. When health courses rank equal with computer courses in schools. When healthcare for males includes discussing the social factors around their well-being. When television telethons raise man money for domestic violence prevention instead of oncology equipment. When training for health professionals requires students to get plenty of rest when men access community health services as often as women, when nurses can be team leaders for doctors, mmm, I'd like to see that, when Long Bay and Petrichard Museums where visitors are amazed at how we used to treat men. So that's my little Ottawa Charter for men, which was, is not my work, was designed by, believe it or not, the paediatrics unit of the Newcastle University. That's just a resource that I produce, email, um, that lots of people are on. If Matt can send that around either to a mailing list or if people want to get a copy of email, just visit my website or email me, which is up there. And I think I'll end on that point, but happy to take any questions or discussion on anything. Oh. Mm -hmm. You all want lunch, don't you? Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. It's lunch. Yep. Okay, thank you. <laughs>